Good afternoon and welcome. This is our lecture titled, The Nature of Menopause. I'm Dr. Stephanie McNally. I am the Associate Regional Ambulatory Physician Executive at Northwell Health, as well as the Director of OBGYN Services for the Katz Institute for Women's Health. And hello, I'm Dr. Christina Delagenitas. I'm the Director of Women's Behavioral Health at Zucker Hillside Hospital at Northwell Health. And so today, um, I hope you enjoy our presentation. We're gonna talk a bit about menopause. We're gonna start with some definitions and then really discuss the role of hormones during this period, um, how they're important for our, um, the, our physical health and also our brain health. We'll talk about common symptoms of menopause and also treatment options. Um, you'll find that our treatment approach is very personalized for women during this time period. So we're gonna discuss both prescription medications, um, complementary, alternative, and integra integrative treatments today. So as we begin, the most important thing is that we're all on the same page with definitions. What is menopause? And even more so, what is the time leading up to menopause? So pre or perimenopause are where things start. That is when your body has changes, particularly with changes in menstrual cycle. You're going to have other symptomatic changes as well. And we're going to go through some of those. For most women, this time can be a year to several years. And it does vary, as Dr. Gilligianeta said, from person to person. Menopause is the definition when your body has one full year without a period. So no blood for 365 plus days. When women go through an early menopause, that occurs at age 45. And the average age for menopause in the United States currently is age 51. So for those of you in the audience that have gone without a cycle at age 45, that is a little bit early. And it's considered premature when women stop their cycles at age 40. There are caveats to that because of certain surgeries, certain lifestyle like smoking, genetic predisposition, autoimmune processes. All of these things contribute to when you go through the pre and menopause period. Things that all need to be addressed with your providers. What's also very important is to start looking at what hormones contribute to you having these changes. The main female hormones that we're going to focus on today include estrogen, progesterone, oxytocin, testosterone, and so certain neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. Estrogen from a physical standpoint is most often made by the ovaries, as is progesterone and testosterone, with certain variations made in peripheral fat and specifically for estrogen, as well as for the adrenal glands, which can also make certain types of testosterone. Yes, and as you noted, estrogen is one of the most important hormones um, that we think about for brain health. Um, it interacts with serotonin in the brain. And the two together are, I would say, one of the two main factors and contributors behind uh, many of the changes women report during this time. And the changes that we're going to discuss with estrogen, the fluctuations and final loss of estrogen are associated with mood, cognition, or thinking, memory um, uh, functions, but also sleep and libido. Uh, because estrogen talks with serotonin in the brain, then that loss of estrogen affects serotonin too. And so uh, serotonin is important also for mood, memory, and sleep. So I think, um, you know, as a reproductive psychiatrist, how closely these are, are linked in the brain and that they're talking to each other and where there's loss of one that obviously impacts the functioning of the other. And that also goes for oxytocin and dopamine as well. And all of these um, interactions, and this is why uh, working with our team collectively is so important. Um, we're gonna put up one slide that I think speaks a lot of volumes. And it is a graph that shows what's happening with your body. And again, 
ovarian function will change over time. So looking at this pre-menopause, perimenopause, post-menopause, and this transition from pre to peri to post, the changes in the estrogen you see are very erratic in this postmenopausal period. That's where that purple line is. And then those levels decrease. Similarly with progesterone, which really affects mood and libido, that will decrease in postmenopausal periods. And that red line that you see there are the symptoms that we're going to get into. So what are you, the audience, experiencing right now? Hot flashes. Vaginal atrophy, another word for dryness. Painful sex, also another word called dyspareunia. So if things are dry, they can be very painful. And that is then related to pelvic floor dysfunction or weakness. That estrogen is a really important driver for the physical tissue and how strong it is. And we're gonna get into that in a little bit more detail. Weight gain and changes. We talked earlier that estrogen is made in the ovaries, but also in peripheral fat. So your body's gonna compensate that. Your libido, which is then related into a lot of what's going on with your brain chemicals, as well as bone and cardiovascular risks. Yes, and so what we also see are mood symptoms. Women can have um, uh, changes in their mood, such as low mood or sadness or, or clinical depression or irritability or changes in the mood, what we, what we call lability. So fluctuations in how their mood is day to day. Um, we also have cognitive complaints that women bring forward. So these are things like forgetfulness, um, difficulty remembering lists. So grocery lists, you're out the door, you had to remember a few things and can't remember everything that was on that list. Um, working memory, trying to multitask becomes more challenging. Um, and then obviously sleep problems. We often see um, that women have difficulty maintaining their sleep. So while they may not have trouble falling asleep, they wake up in the middle of the night and have a hard time falling back asleep. So these are some of the important things to look for so that you can discuss them with your physician. And to, and to piggyback right on what Dr. Diligenatis was speaking of, it's that physical change, whether at night when you're waking up, is it the hot flashes? Is that what's driving you? Right. Um, but some of the other symptoms that we're talking about are the vaginal dryness. That estrogen component changes your tissue quality. And when that quality changes, it becomes drier and that, that can lead to pain and Estrogen also helps with ligaments and holding that tissue strong. And when that estrogen level decreases, I think of it as a bungee that wants to snap. So that sign of prolapse, whether it's your bladder, your rectum, your, your pelvis, all of that does contribute to what's happening. And those are that urogenital symptoms. Bone loss is something we're not gonna get into too much detail, but also very related to the hormone changes and those decreases in estrogen are really what affects the bone density, going from a low bone density called osteopenia to a more significant loss called osteoporosis. Like I mentioned, the fat distribution. So when your estrogen levels are decreasing in the production of the ovaries, your body looks for other sources and peripheral fat, particularly around our mid-region, our body likes to find places to increase estrogen, a different type of estrogen, but still can change your body distribution of fat. And then the cardiovascular changes, which are really important. Um, working for the Katz Institute, cardiovascular health in women is a real part and a pillar of what we look at. So taking that into consideration in the menopause period is really another change that's very important to be focused on. So also speaking of brain health, and so we think holistically of the women going through these changes, and we know uh, that women are at increased risk for depressive disorders across the reproductive life cycle versus men. So sex differences and health issues are really important to us at the Katz Institute. Um, we know that from the point of puberty all the way through menopause, women are, are twice as likely to develop depression than men are. And and particularly around this menopausal period, this premenopausal women who don't have any lifetime history of depression, actually, once they enter the perimenopause, 
um, they're twice as likely to develop clinically significant depressive symptoms um, compared to women who are still premenopausal. And so again, speaking to the importance of the changes of the hormones and the neurochemicals that are associated with this time. Um, you know, the uh, changes in estrogen, the decline, and then the fluctuations have many effects on the brain. And, you know, they're, they're, they're very well linked. And so, you know, we have this estrogen withdrawal or fluctuations, those themselves can just lead to depressive symptoms alone. But they're also linked to increased hot flashes. And so um, the presence of hot flashes is an additional risk factor for the development of, of depression during this time. As Dr. McNally noted earlier, hot flashes can disrupt sleep terribly. And so we know that insomnia is another risk factor for depression. Poor sleep is also associated with impaired focus and attention. Women will report um, uh, brain fog. That's, that's kind of the, the cognitive complaint of women during this time. And again, I told you about um, the impaired organizational skills, multitasking, things like that. And so, um, you know, the way we think about treatment for a woman is to try to consider all the different types of symptom, symptoms that they may have so that we can have a very personalized treatment approach. And that's really, I think, one of the key pieces here is how do we help guide women to advocate for themselves and get that treatment plan that works based on all of the symptomatology? One thing from a physical standpoint, and there's been a lot of literature talking about hormone replacement therapy or HRT. The Women's Health Initiative was a study done many years ago, um, kind of pooling women in a post-menopause period, a year after the periods have stopped. But what they did not do in that study was separate a woman that is 51 just going through that period versus somebody later in their 60s or 70s. So big pieces of changes of how your body is after being without high levels of estrogen and progesterone. So when you look at hormone replacement, you really have to take it in the context of where they are in their reproductive and post-reproductive cycles. Why do I say reproductive versus not? The presence of a uterus changes how we would consider hormone replacement. And when we say hormone replacement, there's various types of things we can do. The presence of a uterus would add not only estrogen that we focus so much on today, but as well as progesterone. And progesterone is the protector, really helps keep the uterine lining stabilized when we're adding estrogen. So that's a key component as you start to develop how we're gonna treat women. And the other piece to this is the perimenopausal versus the menopausal. For a lot of women out there in the audience, if you're going through this kind of pre-menopause stage, Sometimes just an old fashioned birth control pill may be enough to help with some of the symptomatology related from the physical to the emotional and the sleep insomnia changes. So really a dialogue that you need to have, presence of a uterus, where you are in that stage and individualize that care for you. When you're talking about estrogen or hormone replacement, what are we talking about? So again, pills are very commonly used there's also creams, there's also patches, there's also localized treatment rings, creams and patches. Again, a totality of things that we can do and then adding that progesterone if you're giving oral medication for the system. So I wanna stop for one second. With somebody that's taking oral estrogen and the presence of a uterus is still there, you're gonna have an oral medication estrogen that can affect the uterus and that progesterone gives a balance. So that's one type of hormone replacement that was very commonly used and something that you guys may be very comfortable talking about because it has been around for a while. When you're looking at more localized, if we're just treating symptoms of the vagina, which we're gonna talk about, that may be something even with the presence of a uterus that you may not need that additional progesterone. But again, multiple things that are available on the market that need to be individualized. Another big hot topic that we would want to bring up is the bioidentical. 
Why do I bring that up? It's because the bioidentical hormones, which are very similar to the synthetically lab-based or made in a pharmacy, estrogens and progesterones still have the same side effect profile. And this is kind of going back to that women's health initiative. They're going to provide you an information with um, high risk, avoid, or low risk. And that's where that women's health initiative has to be separated from what your overall risk factors are as we're giving you estrogen and progesterone. So again, that progesterone, really important if you're taking oral or systemic patches of estrogen to balance the uterus. But for women that have very significant cardiovascular disease, again, those cardiovascular changes occur more significantly post-menopause. For women who have clotting disorders, meaning your body's at risk for developing a pulmonary clot in your lung or in your body. If you've had a stroke or some type of cardiac um, arrest or heart attack, you are at very high risk where that estrogen, even with the progesterone balance to protect the uterus, may not be good for your overall health status. Intermediate risks like diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, obesity. Again, all of these pieces that really need to be individualized with your provider, but just to keep in the context, multiple options, multiple reasons of how we can proceed. And that's from a system based, usually a lot for um, hot flashes, but there are alternatives. Yes. So, you know, some of the way we think about this, if, if a woman is presenting with mood symptoms and has vasomotor symptoms, um, one way I would approach that is with the use of an antidepressant. So some of the sort of standard of care antidepressants that are on the market, um, we know that those can bring down hot flashes anywhere from 45 to 63%. And so that might give enough relief for women from the vasomotor symptoms where they may not need um, a hormonal option, um, but at the same time treat any mood symptoms of depression or irritability that they're having. For a woman without uh, the mood symptoms, and there are, if there are medical reasons why she's not a, a good candidate for hormonal replacement treatment, there may be too many associated risks with that option, there still are other options. We have um, uh, still can utilize uh, low doses of the antidepressants. Again, those are working on the serotonin and estrogen that are talking to each other in the brain. Um, we have a blood pressure medicine that um, also can bring down hot flashes. And also an, um, a medication that's been around for some time, it's considered an anticonvulsant or anti-epilepsy medicine, but we know that it does a wonderful job of reducing hot flashes. And at certain doses, works as well as estrogen patches. And so for women who maybe are, you know, either choose not or not good candidates for, for hormone replacement therapy, we have some different categories of medications to choose from. And then um, for women that maybe don't have mood symptoms um, or, you know, not, don't have any medical reasons not to take hormone replacement therapy, but have significant vasomotor symptoms and other uh, symptoms of menopause, we can then think of alternative treatments if they're not interested in HRT. And I think Dr. Diligenatis made such a good point too, because there are, again, those multiple medical factors or even just a personal choice that estrogen is not the right fit, especially if I have a lot of patients that I have the privilege of taking care of that have estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive breast cancers. And these are women that we still have these incredible layers of evidence base that can help them avoiding that hormone piece. And some people, again, the personal choice is not, that's not the route that they want to go. So this complementary, integrative, alternative options. Now, from a standpoint of big randomized trials, big literature studies, they're not consistent with the symptoms, but I have patients, and Dr. Jill Janitas has the same thing in her practice. Patients do well with these alternatives, and that's why individualizing your care is so important. The North America North American Menopause Society actually has broken down um, several options. And in my practice, when we talk about how can we help with the hot flashes, 
cooling blankets. Um, I have patients that are, find success with that. Exercise, yoga, meditation actually help increase your natural endorphins, which works on those kind of neurochemical balance in the brain, which some people do feel better from a standpoint, which can help then trigger through other parts of their life. The soy-based products, and there's a multitude on the market, and, and we can kind of sit here and list all of them, um, are also good alternatives, as well as some of the homeopathic and naturopathic um, black hohosh, evening primrose. These actually have been with conjunction for a patient taking multiple ones have improved patients hot flashes. With St. John's wort, some improved um, function with their mood. So again, working with your provider to find a combination. I have patients who take melatonin that they swear by helps their sleep with some of these soy-based products to help with the hot flashes. And that's been enough with some cooling blankets. So again, all of these pieces work together um, as well as some benefit of acupuncture. And then, and I go back to Jill, Dr. Jill Janidis with some of the, um, the other cognitive pieces. Yeah, um, you know, we also take the same approach. So we have the most evidence base for cognitive behavioral therapy, um, acupuncture, weight loss, but so many of my patients find benefit, as you noted, for some of the physical symptoms, but also mood symptoms and for insomnia with the mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, progressive muscle relaxation. So, so we really take all the pieces of literature together. Um, and obviously we need to do more research in women's health to find which, which of these alternative you know, treatments and complementary treatments um, have the best you know, basis of, uh, of working well in women. And so if we've not even complicated it more because there's so much interaction, we're gonna to try to break down some things that may be more specific to help on individual um, treatment options because there is so much out there. And some of those naturopathic pieces, um, you have to just be a little bit cautious about because there are some interactions and that's where your provider can help guide you um, for specific things that you feel you would like to take, but may not be the right option for you. But from a vaginal dryness or that atrophic vaginitis, we can give you some home remedies that may be very helpful. Over-the-counter hydrating um, lubrication. There are websites uh, that have coconut oil and tea tree oil. Reverie is another big company that has hyaluronic acid and you hear acid and you say, oh my gosh, my vagina is already burning. I can't put anything else potentially in there, but they actually do help hydrate the vaginal area. So if dryness is one of those symptoms. That's kind of the big take home for you. That may be helpful. There also is a huge team of physical therapy that can help with strengthening some of the muscle. Again, going back to the essence of what's happening, estrogen decreases, change the tissue quality. So by helping strengthen the pelvic floor, that may actually help with some of the vaginal dryness as well as some of the discomfort that women experience. As I mentioned before, estrogen, you have localized estrogen creams, rings, pills, all of which are a very low dose and are absorbed differently. So for women that are concerned about the systematic effect, the body effects by those oral or patches medication when it comes to estrogen, these localized treatments may be just enough to help you in your overall life without increasing the side effects that we talked about that affect breast cancer risks, that affect cardiovascular risk. So options that are out there. And there's also laser treatments. The laser treatment has been shown to help over a course of several sessions to increase hydration and then by increasing hydration, decrease dryness. And then that will then help with some of the physical symptoms of intercourse that are uncomfortable. There's also a big piece of libido that I just wanna mention here that the mental piece of libido is if you feel as a woman that sex is uncomfortable, that already is a, a roadblock for you then potentially wanting to be intimate. And it's very real and very normal. So by using some of these over-the-counter or low-dose options, 
you may be able to help because the female sexual experience, especially for menopausal women, is very complicated. Bubbles popping all over our heads. Um, so that's something also to be adding to this. Yes, and so obviously another component, um, if there's loss of libido, we have to you know, be sure that um, there's not clinical depression because loss of libido is, is a, a very common symptom of clinical depression. Um, there are very effective treatments for onset, perimenopausal onset depression. Um, estrogen, uh, especially in the form of estrogen patches, have been studied and have very rapid effects, um, but also they decrease vasomotor symptoms as well. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're so linked. We, the estrogen might be, you know, a tremendous benefit for the vasomotor symptoms and then the depression cleared because the women aren't flashing so much um, or it's working on both. Um, but estrogen and estradiol, different types of um, estrogen delivery systems have been studied in uh, perimenopausal onset depression. But also um, what we do see about some of the more hormonal based treatments for depression at this time, they're really most beneficial for women who have not reached menopause yet. So we do not use estrogen or other HRT um, therapies for women who have passed menopause, who are postmenopausal. Um, we know that they don't work at that time. Um, and future studies have to work um, to look at combinations of estrogen and progesterone, like, like oral contraceptives and things like that. So future research and current research is in that area. So for depression in general, the antidepressants that we use at other times of a woman's life are very effective during this time. Um, they can reduce uh, insomnia as well and anxiety around sleep. They reduce vasomotor symptoms. Um, but we have some other, other types of treatments too, cognitive behavioral therapy um, that can help for insomnia or be focused on vasomotor symptoms or be focused on cognitive symptoms. So um, it can be tailored for each woman. Um, and then there are a couple of studies that have come out that actually have looked at uh, psychostimulants, things like, um, uh, you know, like the amphetamines uh, or, um, that are used for attention deficit disorder, that very low doses of that might be indicated for short-term treatment for women who have real difficulties with working memory, focus, attention, and concentration. Um, and, and that would be for a subset of women. So, so in summary, there are so many treatment options um, available for, um, for these symptoms during this transition time. It's just so important for women to know and be empowered to discuss uh, any symptoms they're having. And, and I love it when women are, are anticipating the change and have a plan for the change. And so you're discussing with your clinician what is important to you um, and how you may want to approach that. Your, your clinician can you know, think holistically about your health and tell you what options you may have. Um, and you know, the, the bottom line is that we really do personalized treatment approaches for each woman. I will thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to present today with Dr. McNally, um, and, and thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.